your prayer requests and, and testimonies, and uh, amen, what God has laid on your heart. Praise God. God is good. I really appreciate I, I It just never ceases to amaze me. I know I say it all the time, but it's still true how God just speaks to us through one another. Amen. How he confirms, uh, amen, what's on the heart of the Holy Spirit uh, through his people. And uh, everything Tim said was just so, uh, amen, on point for what God had uh, spoken to me to talk to you about this morning. So I thank the Lord for that as well as thanking Tim for being obedient, amen, to what God yeah. speaks to him too and sharing it with us. So thank you, the Lord. Amen. So God is great. And it's the first day of December, and it's only appropriate that it would snow and be a sloppy mess out there. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Amen. God is good, though. Anybody know what you call a giant animal that nobody cares about? Your elephant. <laughs> what have you guys been hiding? Praise the Lord. Here's a question. I've always wondered about, you know, Adam, and then Eve came Eve, and I just wondered if, uh, did Eve ever have a date with Adam? No, just an apple. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, guys. Making it hard on me. Okay, here's a simple, easy question. Does God love everyone? Yes. yes, of course he does, but he prefers fruits of the Spirit to religious nuts. I know he does, amen. And I probably ought to preface this, first of all, that uh, anybody who, in case you wouldn't know, um, Unitarians, you know, it's a denomination, and they, their belief is basically, I mean, I know I'm dumbing this way down, but basically it just means that they, they accept the moral teachings of the Bible, but they reject the divinity of Jesus. Now, go figure. I mean, I don't know what the world you could create out of that other than religion. Yeah. But nevertheless, what do you get if you cross a Jehovah's Witness with a Unitarian? Someone who goes around knocking on doors for no apparent reason. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, I've made two large groups of enemies here this morning. Praise the Lord. It's all in fun. Praise God. So thank the Lord. <laughs> I actually like that one. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glad God's got a sense of humor. And he know he does or we wouldn't be here. Praise the Lord. Right. All right. Let's go to the Word of God. Psalms chapter 8. And I want to read verses uh, 4 through 6, Peter. Psalms 8, verses 4 through 6. Praise the Lord. I'll just, uh, as he's pulling that up, I'll just remind you from last week where we were talking about being, you know, in Christ before the foundation of the world. In fact, for a couple of weeks, I think I talked about some of that a couple of weeks ago about us already pre-existing and then how all that plays out in our lives today. <clears throat> but we were in Christ, right? And then came the fall, and then we had to be redeemed back to that original condition that we were all in. Amen. And so that's how God knows our end from our beginning. He, we, there is no time with God, so it's all, you know, done. It's all finished, right? Mm -hmm. So here in the, the book of Psalms, he, he says, uh, What is man, asking this of God, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Verse 6. Thou madest him to have dominion over the work of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Praise the Lord. That pretty well describes what God was doing when he created us. Amen. So now let's go to Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll read verses 5 through 11, where this same scripture is uh, referred to. So Hebrews chapter 2 now, in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Are we there? Because I know they're almost identical in the way that there's. Okay, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. So the angels don't have dominion here, is what he's saying. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man 
that thou art mindful of him, or the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the work of, their, of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Now this gets confusing. We'll try to walk through it here as we go along. But we see Jesus. So everything's been put under man, but yet we don't seem to see it that way. That's what he's saying, right? So we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Everybody say every man. Every man. Amen. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now that word glory, wherever it's used, it always represents the manifestation of God or God's presence. We know that the glory filled the temple. It was God that filled the temple and they couldn't minister. And so it, whenever it refers to the glory of God, it's talking about either a manifestation of God, meaning healing, deliverance, whatever it is, or just the presence of God, a manifest presence of God. So for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Praise the Lord. Now I'm going to read that to you because it is a little uh, strange in the way, it's, the way it's put together. But let me read this to you from the Message Bible. This is, still, this is Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 in the Message. It says, God didn't put angels in charge of this business of salvation that we are dealing with here. It says in Scripture, what is man and woman that you bother with them? Why take a second look at their way? You made them not quite as high as angels, bright with Eden's dawn light. And then you put them in charge of your entire handcrafted world. When God put them in charge of everything, nothing was excluded. But we don't see it yet. Don't see everything under human jurisdiction. What we do see is Jesus made not quite as high as angels. And then, through the experience of death, crowned so much higher than any angel with glory, bright with Eden's dawn light. In that death, by God's grace, he fully experienced death in every person's place. Now, part of the reason we don't see everything under our feet, this is just my aside here, is because we haven't realized that we died when he died. Because we cannot reign with him unless we have died with him. Praise the Lord. Now, it isn't a question of whether it was done or not. It's a question of whether or not we operate in it. Yeah. Right? So we know that he put all things under our feet, but for some reason everything doesn't seem to be under our feet. Right? right? This is what he's trying to explain to us. It makes good sense that the God who got everything started and keeps everything going now completes the work by making the salvation pioneer perfect through suffering as he leads these people to glory or to God's presence. Amen? Since the one who saves and those who are saved have a common origin, Jesus doesn't hesitate to treat them as family. Can you, uh, let, me, let me bring up, see, can you bring up verse 13? Yeah, uh, oh, no, let me just, I can do it, I can do it, amen. Well, I'm right there. Jesus says, Again, I will put my... This is Jesus talking. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is, even I live by placing my trust in God. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, Jesus said clearly, I don't, anything I do, it's not me that's doing it, it's the Father that's in me. He does it. Anything I say, I'm only saying what the Father says. Right? I only say what I hear my Father say. So that's, that's what he's saying. Jesus, even I live by placing my trust in God. Okay? So, here we go. God wanted man to have his image and his likeness and to live in his presence. Praise the Lord. That's what we were created for, was to live or to be in the presence of God. So the creation of man was God's uh, greatest production. And in Genesis 1.31, he describes man as being very good. But the truth is, what God intended for man and what man's current experience is, are very different. Mm -hmm. Amen? 
And the difference is a result of man choosing to disregard the principles, amen, that are actually inherent in God's creation. In other words, we disregard the principles that are established in His creation, which ought to tell us something about how we're supposed to operate. Amen? God is a God of principles. And so everything that He created was established to operate, amen, by certain principles that guarantee their proper function. Amen? How you all know, all we ever hear about anymore is, uh, you know, the from the EPA. It's all about uh, environmental issues, right? And it was global warming, but then that didn't work out so well because we found out that it isn't just getting warmer, it's getting colder at times, and it's doing all sorts of weird stuff. And I've lived long enough to tell you this kind of crap's been going on ever since I've been alive, amen? I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't be sensitive to our environment. I'm just saying this is the way it is, praise the Lord, and it's not some newfangled thing or some new thing that has come up. So, uh, in other words, what I'm saying is environment's important, but we need to understand it, right? So Jesus said even he lived by placing his trust in God. Right. Amen? He's, uh, I, I, oh, I won't go through all of it right now, but anyway. Whether it's whether it's plant or animal, whether it's, you know, fish or birds or celestial bodies, you know, stars and, and uh, planets and, and whatever else there might be out there, or whether it's a human being. The principles ordained by God are to preserve and to protect and to assure the maximum performance of each created thing. Amen? I mean, it's rational. I mean, it doesn't, that's not like a leap of faith to believe this. That's just reality, all right? So that's all I'm trying to explain is that they're there to preserve. God preserved them, ordained by God. They're to preserve, to protect, amen, and to assure the maximum performance of whatever that thing is in that environment. Amen? So uh, the most important thing is, as far as God's principles are concerned, just bear with me. The most important thing concerning the principles of God is the principle of environment. Praise the Lord. Now, the word environment is defined as circumstances, objects, and conditions that surround us. This is an environment, right? I mean, and then there's a bigger environment, and there's all sorts of environments, right? The word environment is defined as circumstances, objects, and conditions that surround us, okay? So by definition, an environment may refer to the forces that affect the state of things, amen, the components that make up the climate in which something exists. Everything in life, now listen, everything in life was created to function within a particular environment. Yes. Amen. God prescribed that environment for them before he created them, whatever yes. it was. Amen. Now let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 through 8. I'm not trying to give a science lesson here, honestly, but I'm saying the stuff that we pick out and start calling science, and God had all this stuff long before we ever came up with a definition or a, a way of trying to teach it, and most of the time what we've done is screw it all up because we've taken our own twist off of it instead of looking at the original word that God was trying to get to us, amen, and then turned it and dumbed it down into some human thing. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now watch closely this, because it's going to show up here over and over. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now I want you to, what I'm trying to get you to see here is the uh, kind of the... Uh, the way he moves forward, the, the, the correlation of this thing from beginning and then to fulfillment. The, uh, almost, it's almost like a chronological thing, although there's no time yet. So I'm just saying that's what I'm looking at here. So God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. 
And God made the firmament and, wa and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. All right, if you can drop down to verse 14 now through 18, verses 14 through 18. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So time, this is where time starts. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Amen. So when the environment was ready, now here's the point I'm trying to make. God called forth each creation from its intended source. All right? And then he put it in the specific environment that he had already created. Is that making sense to you? Let me, we'll just go a little bit further here. Look at Genesis chapter 1, uh, 9 through 12. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Amen. Now drop down to verse 20 through 25. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So before God created the sun and the moon, before he created the stars, first he called light, right? And then he separated it from darkness. So you've got daylight, right? Day is light and dark is night, okay? Then he makes a firmament, or an expanse, to separate the waters from the waters below. The waters above from the waters below, right? Mm -hmm. And only then, that's when God calls forth lights from heaven and sets them to make the day and the night and the seasons. Mm -hmm. Right? Creating then plants, animals. It's the same pattern. He's doing the very same thing. The dry ground that he has separated now is the environment, right? Mm -hmm. And the waters are the environment, yeah. depending on what the species is that he's creating. It's coming out of what he has already designated as their environment. Yeah. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying? I'm confused with you. So he creates an environment, and then from that environment, he calls out of that environment what it is that is to be living in that environment, what's supposed to exist in that environment. You can't have the, the thing without the environment for the thing. That's what he's trying to get us to understand. So he doesn't just go out there and start making stuff. He creates an environment for whatever that thing is that he's making to live perfectly in, where it can exist, where it can thrive, where it can be the best possible thing that it can be, right? So that's, that's what we're talking about here. So this, now we've got day, night, seasons, we've got animals. We've got, so he's creating plants and animals. That's re revealing the same pattern. Dry ground, the water's in the sea. And then only, only then after he's created those things, does he tell them, he commands them, in fact, to bring forth, yeah. amen, fish, right, to the seas. And to the land he calls out vegetables, yeah. trees, plants, all that kind of stuff. 
than the livestock? Right, because the livestock got to have something to eat, right? They can't, it's not good enough just to have land. The plant's got to have land to grow in, right. right? And then he creates, the from that same environment, he calls out the animals that will then live in that environment and, and thrive in that environment, right? Wild animals, uh, cattle, uh, according to kind, according after their own seed, after the seed that's in them. That's the every, way everything is created, right? Yep. So out of them comes, just like out of the environment comes, right? Yep. That's how he creates. That's how he works. Amen. So finally, look at Genesis now, chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, right? Yep. So get it. Here it is. It reveals God is man's source. Does it not? Yes. So when God made man, he spoke to himself. And man came out of him. Yeah. Are you following me? So man was created to be both the same essence of God, which is spirit, and to live in the same environment as God, which is the realm of the spirit or the environment of God. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. and it's important. I know it sounds like, well, it's just trite. You know, it's, you know, we, we don't. Look, yep. stuff that's going on with the environment today, they, they have no idea what they're talking about. They're trying to adapt the environment to the thing. It doesn't work that way. We have to go to the environment. We have to be in the right environment. Praise the Lord. So uh, God prescribed an environment for everything that he created. So environments can be good or they can be bad. They can be positive or they can be negative. Amen. They can be healthy or they can be unhealthy. Right. Right? Right, let me just, let me explain this because that's really not accurate. But see, it's not the environment itself. And the environment itself isn't necessarily bad. It isn't necessarily negative or, or unhealthy. The real issue is really a misplaced person, animal, or object. Amen. A particular environment is wrong only because the thing wasn't designed to function in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you, you know what I'm saying. It's obvious. The prescription and the actuality don't match. Right. So, it's obviously important that we understand the environment prescribed for each of us. Yep. Right? I mean, because it's the environment that determines the success or the failure of the thing or the individual that's in it. That's why God put man in Eden. Eden is man's ideal environment. All right, Isaiah 51, verse 3. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of men. And that's important. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So he's saying, you screwed up the environment. You got in the wrong environment. But if you'll get in the right environment, joy, gladness. All right. Praise the Lord. Ezekiel 28, verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the, in the day that thou wast created. In Eden, the garden of God. So when God planned what man was going to be, spirit, and how man would function by faith, right? God also determined where man would live, his environment, his ideal environment, okay? God chose a specific spot on this planet, and he put man in that specially chosen place, amen, which we know is Eden. So the next question then would be, to me anyway, what's Eden? 
the root in the Hebrew word Eden is, isn't certain. You, can't, you won't find it. Amen. But the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is what they used in Jesus' day, called the Septuagint, relates the word to a Hebrew verb, Eden, or actually Aiden, A-Y-D-E-N is the Hebrew word, which means delight. So Eden is translated the garden of delight or the garden of the Lord. Just immediately, it, the first thought that came to me when I was doing this study was David said, I delight myself in the Lord. Yes. This goes to what Tim was talking about. Now, this is what I'm trying to connect these dots here. Because he was saying, if we would love the Lord, if we would just praise the Lord, just thank the Lord. Just what, what are we doing? We're creating an environment. Yes, we are. Now, we don't, you know, we may not know the science of this. It doesn't matter if we understand the science of it. What, what matters is yes. what ends up happening. Amen. <laughs> And so that's why the Bible tells us about praising the Lord and worshiping the Lord. It doesn't give us the breakdown because it assumes we'll just figure this out or we'll just do it because it's what the Bible says. Yeah. Amen. And so uh, delight yourself in the Lord. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking, God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. So are you getting what I'm saying here? Praise the Lord. Here's the picture. Eden was the one place where God's presence dwelt on earth at that time. Now, you know, we know God is everywhere, but we also know that because He's everywhere, it's almost like He's nowhere. Right. You, know, you know what I'm saying? It's when He manifests or when we feel His presence or recognize His presence that we go, ah, the Lord. So that's what this is about. This is where God manifests His presence in the earth. The only place that He did at the time. Amen. It was the garden of His presence. Praise the Lord. And that's precisely where God placed Adam and then Eve. Amen. Why? Because He wanted unbroken fellowship between God and man. That was the environment, amen, that God planned for man. The environment that God planned for us was that we would be in constant relationship with Him. That we would be in constant fellowship, interaction with Him. Yes. Praise the Lord. So outside of, get this now, outside of God's presence, we create a state of malfunction for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It isn't God doing it. It isn't even the devil doing it. It's us doing it. Right. Amen. Because everything that is not in its ideal environment malfunctions. Yeah. You cannot grow... Uh, corn in a rice paddy. Right? right? I mean, you, you, can't, uh, you can't throw a cow in the ocean and think that he's going to survive out there or that he's going to thrive, thrive there because it's not his environment. You take the fish out of the water and he dies. Why? Because land is not his environment. The ocean is it or the waters or the sea or the rivers, whatever. That's his environment. That's what God created him for. Yes. Or created him out of. Right? All right, so, uh, amen. So it's fish have to be in water, right? Yeah. Plants have to be in the ground, yeah. right? They don't have to be, but if they're going to survive, if they're going to flourish, that's where they've got to be. Yeah. Amen. So man's life and the fulfillment of our destination, or, or, or you could say our destiny, actually, is only possible to the extent that we walk and talk with God in the garden of His presence. Praise the Lord. And what religion has done is tried to substitute one day a week, amen, or two days a week or whatever, and a ritual, amen, for an environment. That is not an environment. That's a false environment. It's not bad. It's not wrong. It just isn't where you're going to flourish. Amen. So the fall of man, we say sin, is really just simply a fall from God's presence. No longer in the right environment. Right? Look at Genesis 3, verses 23 and 24. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Why? Because he didn't believe God. He didn't operate as God, saying what God said. Amen. He said what the devil said. And he got what the devil said. So 
Therefore God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. We know that God is the tree of life. Amen? And so he, man could no longer be in that place, in the place of the presence of God, in the environment that he was created for. Okay? And so we said Eden means the place of God's presence. So man's banishment from Eden meant banishment from his presence, from the presence of God. Amen. Condemned to live apart from the one who was essential to his well-being. Now, the history of man, and you don't have to do a whole deep, in-depth study, shows the consequences of that separation. Man is in the wrong environment, and the result is he's dead as far as his true identity, as far as what he's supposed to be doing, right? Amen. And so, uh, praise the Lord, uh, these are consequences that were built into God's principles for man's life. Praise the Lord. Psalms 51, uh, verses 10 and 11. Here's to another thing that Tim said. We'll speak to it now. Praise the Lord. I'm just summarizing Tim's message. Praise the Lord. <laughs> if you understand. I mean, that's what I was thinking all the time I was sitting there. I was just all excited. Praise the Lord. I was feeling the Holy Spirit. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So here's, here's the deal. Sinners are malfunctioning saints. Amen. This is the problem with our world today. What God pronounces very good is very wrong. And it's wrong because we lost our ideal environment. Man was a good creation in the wrong place and started malfunctioning from that point on. Now when sin entered or when this happened, God told Adam, the day you do this, you're going to die. Well, we know, and we've argued about this. Well, he didn't die. He lived thousands of years. No, he was dead as far as God was concerned. He, his, he was no longer in the presence of God. He was in, an, in a dead environment. Yeah. Amen? So death is the absence of God's presence in your life. Right? We see sinners out here, and we think, oh, they just are hateful, ugly, terrible people. No, they're dead. Yeah. They're dead people. They're dead to everything that God has for them, everything that God wants for them, because they're in a wrong environment. They're like a fish laying up on the seashore. He's not going to survive there long, right? They rot. Then they begin to stink, and they begin to foul up the environment that they're in, yeah. right? So look at Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10 now. Death is the absence of God's presence in your life, and that's why the Scripture says, we've done all the dying we're going to do. We were dead until we were born again. And once we're born again, we'll never die again. Yeah. We'll never leave the environment that we were created to be in. We'll never be away from the presence of God. We'll never be outside of the presence yeah. of God. Now, this physical body might go, but that's irrelevant. That isn't, what, that isn't what we were created for anyway. This just gives us a legal right to be on the planet. Amen? For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the what? The ungodly. He didn't die for good people. He didn't die for people that were going to work really hard and try to be good. He died for people that were ungodly or died for people that were already dead. Yes. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Praise the Lord. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners or while we were dead, Christ then died for us much more how else are you going to get a born again if, if there isn't a death, right? You're already dead. So somebody who is in the environment, who is connected to that environment, has to give it up. Yeah. Willingly. In order for us to be made alive. Yeah. To get back into the environment. So Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved yes. by His life. Yes. Because now we're back in the right environment. Yes. See what I'm saying? Amen. So God came to our rescue. Yes. 
Amen. Because he wants his family back. Because he wants that relationship. Because he wants us back in him. The yes. environment that we have to have to survive, to thrive in. Amen. So the saints who are in the wrong environment are incapable of functioning correctly. So he came to restore us to our right environment. Now when we have people, anybody, me, it doesn't matter, who reject the teaching of God for their own reasons, justified or not, are operating in a malfunctioning way because they're not in agreement with God. That's why Jesus, he, he, why, why did things work for Jesus if they didn't work for anybody else? Because he was in the right environment. Yes. He only said what his father said. He came out from his father, amen, and God created an environment for him which was the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. He, he, he knew God will never leave. In fact, think about it. When he was on the cross, what happened? He got put in the wrong environment. He immediately realized, I'm not in the environment I was created for. God is cut off from me. I, I can't tell. Where, where are you, God? Where have you, where have you gone? Why, why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you pitched me out or kicked me out of the environment that you created me for? In other words, he got Adam's issue. He got what Adam purchased, which was the wrong environment. He knew it immediately. immediately the moment it happened, he recognized it. So, see, the idea of restoring us to our Eden or to our environment, the right environment, the God environment, has been God's plan all along. That's what he's always intended. That's what he always wanted. Your value. See, people's values don't change as far as God's concerned. Just their environment. How many of you know everybody was in Christ before the foundation of the world? But not everybody's getting back into that right environment, back into that environment because they don't make the right choices. Because they reject the environment that's given to them. They do what Adam and Eve did. They listen to the devil. They believe in the, in the lies uh, rather than in the truth. And that keeps them in the wrong environment. Keeps them functioning in a malfunctioning environment. Amen? So Jesus paid the exact price that you were worth. Amen? He gave a perfect life away. And that's what God says you're worth. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he would have demanded less. Mm -hmm. He laid down his image to buy you back. Even though you sinned, even though he knew you would sin after this, amen, you still retain the image. In other words, your value didn't change when your environment changed. Adam's uh, value didn't change just his environment changed. Yeah. He was still valuable to God or God wouldn't have made a plan in order to get us back. Yeah. Right. right? So we had to be valuable to God or he would have just said, oh, it's just junk anyway. Let it go. Let it go out there with the rest of the junk. Right? right? So God devised a plan to redeem you or to restore you to the right environment or to his presence. Yes. Amen? Now notice, the Bible is a story of God's efforts, not our efforts. That's what religion has done. It's turned it into us trying to change the environment. It's what the EPA is doing today. Yeah. Amen. Sorry about that, but that's just the way I see it. And uh, you're not going to do it. No. <laughs> You've got to get to the right environment. Praise the Lord. And this is why we have to practice the presence of God. Yes. Listen, this is why he says pray. Why, why, does, why does he tell us to pray when he tells us in another place, I already know what you have need of. I want you in my presence because that's where you'll get what you have need of. Yeah. I've got it. It's all there. It's all available. It's in you, in Christ, right? So you've got to get to that environment. How do you get to that environment? By being conscious, amen, of God's presence. Because we know He's everywhere. But the environment that He wants you in is where you are specifically connected with Him. Where you're communicating. Where you're doing what He was doing with Adam. He's walking in the afternoon coming to see how things are going. Not because he didn't know, but because he wanted yes. to enter into that environment and interact with Adam yes. in the environment that he had created him for, which was God, or the presence of God. Amen? So, Genesis 4, verses 3 and 4. 
I'm just trying to say what the Bible says without being, without using religious terms. I mean, it's, this, is, this is just God saying, look, if you'll come back to me, if you'll come back and interact with me, if you'll talk to me, if you'll, if you'll uh, pray to me, if you'll believe me, if you'll say what I say, that's practicing his presence. That's, yeah. that's getting into the environment where all of these things are naturally there for you. Right? So in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Why? Because it cost human life. It cost, or not human life, but it cost life. It, it, there was shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no uh, atonement, right? There's no uh, forgiveness. So here's what happens. What, was, what were Cain and Abel really doing? They were trying to get back in touch with God. They were trying to get back to the environment that their dad had them all kicked out of. They were struggling, trying to figure out, how can we get back to this environment? So God gives them these things. That's why the animal sacrifices were, were throughout the Bible. You think about the outdoor altars. Cain and Abel, the first one mentioned here. Then you've got Noah, you've got Abraham, you've got Moses. Those outdoor uh, altars eventually gave way to enclosures. The tent, the tabernacle, the temple. All were places of God's presence. Amen? So inheritance isn't something you earn. It's something you get as a gift. They were trying to earn it. They were trying, that's what the temples and the, that's what, you know, Cain and Abel were doing. They were trying to work, somehow work their way back into the presence of God or to create somewhere where God would show up for them. Amen. They couldn't get back to the environment. They couldn't have the environment, but they could have it temporarily. They could have a piece of it, I guess you could say. And that was the reason for the law. That was the reason for the tabernacle, the temple, and everything else. Amen. That goes along with it. So, John, uh, John 17, uh, verse 3. So we've made, you know, even praying and stuff, we've made it religious exercise. And it's not at all. It's supposed to be just natural. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's times when we want to get on our knees and, and, and really bear down. For, because, but it's about us. It's not about God. What God wants is just as we go through our day, just to acknowledge, yeah. to be aware, just to be conscious that I'm in the right environment. God's right here with me. He's for me. He's on my side. He's got my back, right? Yes. Right? Let go. Yeah. Let God cast all your care upon the Lord. You, you, you're not going to do that if you're not in the right environment. Nope. Right? So this is eternal life, or life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Right? So through Jesus, we gain access to every part of of God's dwelling place, wherever he is, amen? He is the sacrifice, the blood, the dwelling place, or the presence of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. His death destroyed the veil that separated God's dwelling place from his people. Yes. That's the picture that we're getting with the temple. All right, so now look at this, John 17 verses, and we're going to read a little lengthy bit here just because I think to understand this we need to. John 17 verses 4 through 26. Now just look at it in the context of what we're talking about here. John 17, 4 through 26. I have glorified thee on the earth. What is that? What we already established to be glorified. What is the glory of God? It's the presence of God. It's a manifestation of God. That's what Jesus was. He was a physical manifestation of God. Mm -hmm. So he said, I've glorified thee, or I've given my presence to you in the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me with thy own self and with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Praise the Lord. The environment where you and God are. 
Right? That's, the, that's what the new birth is about. So, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. In other words, it's because of the environment, because I'm my connection with you. For I have given unto them the words which you gave me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world or for the people outside of the environment. Amen. Amen. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. They are in the environment that they're supposed to be in, and I'm praying that they will uh, be able to cooperate and operate within that environment the way you intended them to. All are mine, all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. All right, here we go. We now become an environment for Jesus. Praise the Lord. So I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. How, can, how are we one? I'll tell you how we're one, because we operate in the same environment. Yeah. That's the difference between Christians and non-Christians. That's the difference between believing and unbelieving. That's the difference between people who are willing to operate according to the Word of God and those who aren't. They may both be saved, but only one of them is operating in the right environment. And that's how we find connection. That's how we connect with people is because they're in the same environment we're in. When we if you think about it, when you step out into the world and you're no longer around other Christians, mm -hmm. it just doesn't feel right, does it? Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't like them or it's not even the stuff that they're doing so much. It's just weird. It's just odd. It just doesn't feel right because yeah. it's the wrong environment. It's like, how long can you tread water? Yeah. You, know, you better be good at it yeah. because if you're in that environment, it'll kill you. And we sense that. Our spirit senses it. So, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Now, those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee. And these things I speak in the, word, in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them the word, and the world has hated them because of it. Because they see the contrasting environments. They, they see the conflict between their environment and our environment. Amen. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So in other words, yeah, they're in the world and they can't do anything about it because that's what they were created for. Physically, they were created for this world. But there is an environment within an environment, amen, that they need to be in. They need to understand that, right? So they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Now, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Yeah. In other words, our environment is not the world environment. It's a separate environment. Even though we're in it, we're not of it. This isn't where we draw our source and our strength and our, everything that we have need of. It doesn't come from the world. It comes from an environment within this world. See, Adam and Eve had everything as long as they were in the environment. They were still in the world when they left the garden. They just weren't in the presence of God anymore. They just weren't in the environment that he had created to produce everything they needed. So now they got to do it because they're outside of the environment. Now they're in an environment where they got to tread water and they got it by the sweat of their brow. They got to make things happen. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Praise the Lord. They're not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What is sanctification? Sanctification is to be set apart. Set apart where? Into the right environment. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Lord Forgive me if I'm getting excited. Hallelujah. <laughs> it even makes sense to me sometimes. Glory to God. Now, here's the deal. Everybody who accepts the gift of grace becomes a dwelling place for grace. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. See, this is why it's important. That's why God says, love one another. Forgive one another. Why? Because you're in an environment where that is the principle that, that drives everything. And if you're not going to function by that, then you are in the wrong environment. You might as well be in the world. You don't swim on the earth. You swim in the water. You don't fly in the water. You fly in the space above the water. Everything has its 
season, its place, its time, its, its function within the environment they were created for. When you leave the environment you were created for, you struggle because you're not in the place where everything flows from God. Now you're trying to make it happen. It's like walking on water. That's what Jesus was trying to show them. I can walk on water. Why? Because I'm going to be in the same environment, whether I'm on water, whether I'm in the air, whether I'm in the ground or under the ground. Because this isn't my environment. It just happens to be the one I'm going through. I'm, the environment I live in is my relationship with God or my knowledge of this oneness that I have with Jesus or with the Father. You see what, you see what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. All right, 1 Corinthians. Or, yeah, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. See, the gift of grace literally becomes a dwelling place. Not you, it's the place God has put you. Yes. Amen? Where everything's provided. Where God just supplies your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You, know you not that you are the temple of God? That the spirit of God dwelleth in you? Amen? Uh, chapter 6, verse 19. Still 1 Corinthians. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. Again, he's, he's still talking about environment. Because if we don't recognize that what this really is for, is for God to be able to create an environment for him and I to exist in. If it just becomes this, even though I have God here, I'm not operating from that environment, so I'm not getting the benefits of that environment, so I'm still struggling... If I'm not saying what God says about the situation, if I'm not speaking to the circumstances the way God has spoken to them, I'm in a wrong environment. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Because the only place I thrive is in the right environment. The environment I was created to be in, which is relationship with God. Yep. I hope I'm not getting bizarre here, but I'm just trying to... Since the Holy Spirit is God... He's key to getting us into God's presence. That's why he said he will lead you and guide you into all truth. Jesus said, I'm the truth, yes. the light and the way. So the Holy, the Holy Spirit isn't necessarily there to tell us about what's going to happen tomorrow or next month or next year. Now, he can. There's prophet, prophetic witnesses and so on and so forth. But really what he's saying is the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into a self-awareness of this relationship or this environment that God created for us. Yes. Jesus said he'll tell you everything I've been telling you. Yes. He's only going to echo. He's just going to repeat what I've been yes. doing and what I've been saying so you can understand the way I did this wasn't because of me. It was because of the environment I was in. Yes. And my acknowledging of that environment produced the manifestation of God or the presence of God, healing, deliverance, prosperity, whatever it might have been. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. John 14, 26. So the Holy Spirit is the key to getting us into God's presence today because if you're, if you're aware of the Holy Spirit, if you're aware of God's presence, then God can communicate with you. If you're listening, you'll hear, right? The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, see, our hopes should not be fixed on heaven. Not on what we're going to get someday, if we're good enough, if we last long enough, if we do whatever. Amen? Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. You know, eternity, we're going to be here on earth. So how is the earth going to function? Because the earth is going to be the environment again. Right now, that environment exists strictly within me. And wherever I go, it's kind of like Abraham. Wherever I go, the environment goes with me. As long as I'm connected, as long as I'm staying focused, right? But the day is going to come when the whole earth is going to be that environment again. Amen. We were created to be on earth. 
Praise the Lord. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove the candlestick out of his place, except you repent or change your mind. So the emphasis is remember where you fell from. Right? Where did we fall from? The environment that we were created for. Right? Remember God promised the privilege to eat from the tree of the knowledge of, or not the knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life. Amen? To whoever overcomes. It's in, the, it's in Revelation. He says, to whom over, who, whoever overcomes, I will give to them the ability to eat from the tree of life. Or in other words, they'll, they'll have eternal life. They'll have the environment that they were created for. The presence of God. Everywhere. Anywhere. Amen? So, he's telling us the tree of life to them who overcome. And how are, are we overcomers? By the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So we can return to the fruit of the tree of life, which is God life. Yes. Praise the Lord. See, the important thing about these two deals are they're connected because they both are related to the garden of God's presence where this whole divine purpose started. Amen? The right environment. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you will prosper, right? Yeah. But every tongue that rises in judgment against you. Yeah. So, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that ri shall rise against you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. That's Old Testament, but in the New Testament, it's children of God. Uh, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Yeah. So, the weapon that's formed against you is the weapon of a tongue of judgment and condemnation. That's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. As long as they were in the right environment and operating by that in, within the, 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 the function of that environment, they were fine. But when they started listening to the devil, what happened? The first thing that happened was they felt condemned. God didn't, hadn't condemned them or hadn't judged them yet at all, hadn't said anything to them. They had already condemned themselves based on what the devil had said. So no weapon formed against you can prosper. What are the weapons that are formed against you? Condemnation. Yes. Guilt. Shame. Yes. Coming for either from your own consciousness or from the enemy himself or from somebody around you. Yes. Amen. So I think, I think the greatest hindrance to our seeing miracles and, and healings yes. are the words of judgment. Yes. Whether they're coming from me or from somebody else. I mean, from myself personally. Amen. The enemy says, if you didn't have sin in your life... I don't. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Yes. I'm in a pristine environment. Yes. And for that environment to be pristine, I must be. Otherwise, I would yes. mess up the environment. Yes. Amen? Right. Praise the Lord. Matthew 9, or excuse me, John 9, verses 2 and 3. So this is where the guy, you, you know this one, the guys, uh, they're all standing around saying, hey, who sinned? This guy's blind from birth or whatever. Uh, how come? What did he do? Or did he do it or was it his parents that did it? Sin, it's all about the sin, right? And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. Or another translation is so that the glory of God can be revealed. So that... The environment of God can be seen on earth. Right. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. See, these people have been in the wrong environment for millennium. And he's trying to correct that. So behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, and said unto the sick of the palsy, Rise up and walk. You're healed. Praise the Lord. No, he said, your sins are forgiven you. He's trying to create the environment yes. where healing is natural. Yes. Where sin no longer exists. Right. Where the enemy can't use you against you. Right. 
Hallelujah. See, when Jesus removed the awareness of sin, he sets us up for miracles. He gets us into an environment where the miracles are natural. They just happen. It isn't big me and little you or this really anointed. No, it's just an environment where that is the norm. That is natural. Praise the Lord. It's all related to the glory of God or God's presence. The glory filled the tabernacle, right? The glory was in Eden. It was normal in Eden. How do we know that? Because Adam and Eve went around not in uh, you know, Brooks Brothers suits and uh, you know, some woman's fashion. They went around in the glory, the presence of God. They didn't know they were naked. Not until the presence left, until the environment changed. And now all of a sudden, what had been natural in the right environment became a messed up deal in the wrong environment. Because now I'm going to freeze, I'm going to be cold, I'm going to be embarrassed, I'm going to be ashamed, and blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? Never bothered them at all when they were in the right environment. Now all of a sudden, because they're not in that environment, now everything that God had provided for them doesn't work out there. Praise the Lord. So the Bible's trying to get us to understand God's purpose isn't for us to fly away someday to be with Him. Now, I believe in heaven, and I believe we will go to heaven. But heaven isn't a permanent dwelling place for us. It's a waiting place. It's a place until everything is wrapped up and the new earth and the new heaven is created. And then we go back there because that is an environment. Right now, the environment that is perfect is heaven. But when God recreates the earth, it will be the perfect environment as well. Right now, the only place on earth where there is the perfect environment is where people are connected to the Lord the way Jesus was when he was here on earth. In the world, but not of the world. The day will come when we will even be of the world, but it will be because the world is a new creation. It will be the garden again all over, but it will be the garden everywhere on earth. How do you think people are going to live to be a thousand years old and still be considered a baby? They're in a God environment where time doesn't exist. Eternal. It'll be as eternal on earth as it is in heaven. We'll live in his presence. And we can today in this world. So then all of God's work through the Old Testament to the days of uh, Jesus and to the days of the church has been to get us back into the environment where he first put us here on earth. And that environment is his ongoing presence. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Focus. That's his environment. That's the environment he created us for. See, it's, it really isn't so much where you're located, but who is located where you are. Praise the Lord. doesn't matter if you're in Africa, if you're in Asia, if you're in the Middle East, if you're in Alaska, the North Pole, if you're totally isolated somewhere by yourself, amen. It isn't where you are. It's the fact that he's there. And if you're aware of it, you've got a good environment. Yes. Amen. We need God's presence in order to function. Why else would he create a new heaven and a new earth? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So he's making another environment for us. And that's one that, like the atmosphere man once enjoyed, in the Garden of Eden will be for everybody everywhere on the planet. Yes. Eternal life. Yes. Perfection. Yes. God's presence. Revelation 21, uh, verses 1 and 2. Let's go on with this. So I saw a new heaven, new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, 
New Jerusalem, that's us, by the way, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Okay, that's the saints that have died and gone to heaven that are waiting for the resurrection of the body. And this is them coming back. We may be in that number. We may just be here and be changed. I don't know. But I'm just saying. What happens? He's coming back. They're prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Coming back to the environment that was especially designed yes. for this bride and her husband to dwell in. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Verse 22 and 23. And we know the, the analogy there, the metaphor for the wedding is that they become one, right? Yeah. So I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. This is the new, this, this new earth. And the city had no need of the sun. Think them back to Genesis. Neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. It's a God environment. Yes. Perfect God environment. Yeah. Amen. New earth. It won't need a sea to provide water. It won't need a sun and a moon to provide light, because God himself will be our light and our life. Just like Adam and Eve enjoyed continual fellowship with God in Eden, we'll wake up every morning in God's presence. No matter where we are, it'll be like the song we just sung a few minutes ago. We will breathe in life. Yes. We're in God atmosphere. Every breath we take will be an eternal breath. Yes. The breath of life, right? Ongoing forever in his presence. So here's the deal. We don't have to wait for a new earth to live with God. It's going to happen for sure for everybody that's on this planet. Amen? I'm talking about people that have accepted Christ, that are born again. But he wants to live and abide in us right now. Yes. He that abides in me and I in him will bring forth much fruit. In other words, he'll produce the glory of God. Yeah. He's in the atmosphere where those things are natural. Yep. Naturally supernatural. Amen? Yeah. He wants to abide in you now, and he will. And he can, if you start praising him and filling his test, your home, you, with his testimonies. Testimonies of how great he is. How good he is. How he has blessed you. Are you seeing what I'm saying? We make those things just ritual, religious acts that we do. No, he's saying when you do that, you're acknowledging you're in the right environment, that you're connected to me. And within that environment, how, how many of you, when you start praising the Lord, God becomes more real? He doesn't become more real. He just becomes more real to you. Why? Because the environment starts to change. We, we've seen this in church services, in our private prayer time, and, and, and you know, interacting with God. All of a sudden, you get cheered up. All of a sudden, the burden lifts. All of a sudden, the weight, the fear, the anxiety. All of Why? Because the atmosphere has changed. You're no longer held captive to this false atmosphere, this lie of being of the world. You're caught back into the atmosphere of God where you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're not affected by the world, or the world doesn't dictate your results. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just start bragging about God from a pure heart, the way David talked about it. Psalms 51, let's read verses 9 through 17. I'm about done here. Praise the Lord. We'll be done by noon. Psalms 51, 9 through 17. Hey, I've faked it many times, I can tell you. When I didn't feel God at all, and I was concerned and upset and worried about the situations and circumstances I was going through, but just start praising God. In fact, for years, I, I didn't know this. I'd just go to the Psalms and start reading the Psalms. And for the most part, every Psalm you read, it may start out a little negative, but it'll end up positive. It's almost like he starts out in the world as if he's of the world, and he ends up still in the world, but not influenced by it. Believing that God's going to do this. God's going to do that. And he starts praising the Lord and talking about what God will do. So I hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with a free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O oh Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praises. David had an understanding of this. Amen. It will change the atmosphere. Yes. Praise the Lord. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not in burnt offerings, or delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Now that doesn't mean he wants you defeated. It's saying you're not operating by your spirit anymore. You're operating by his spirit. Amen. You're not allowing the world to affect your feelings and your emotions. Amen. You're trusting in God and God will not despise that or God will honor that. You're saying I'm not that uh, that environment doesn't control me. It doesn't rule me. Your presence is my reality. Praise the Lord. Amen. So uh, Jesus God will, God will come to you right where you are. He'll set up His throne in your house. In the tabernacle. Amen. That's His plan. And I believe it's coming to pass in our generation. I think it's the reason for a lot of the things we've heard preached in our lifetimes, especially over the last maybe 20 years, 15, 20 years, whatever it's been. Things that we never heard before. Things that were so contrary to a lot of the religion that we were taught. And I'm not, I'm not listen, I'm not saying... All of that was bad. Thank God. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have ever been able to move beyond that had I not had a, at least that experience. People were sincere, trying to tell you what they believed the truth to be. Amen? But think about it. He became poor. He came into this environment and let this environment influence him so that we could be taken out of this environment and put into the environment where it wouldn't influence us. And that's what he's saying every time he talks about he became poor so that you could become rich. Amen. He became sin so you could become the righteousness of God. Amen. By his stripes, he received the beating. He received the sickness. He received the disease so that we could live healthy whole lives. By his stripes, we were healed. Amen. He just switched environments with us. So God's creating a new order where the power of Satan is defeated in your life simply because we make room for his presence. Now look at this, Romans 7, verse 24. And I'm, this is the last scriptures we're going to read, but there's, it's rather lengthy. But I want, you to see, I want you to see the connection, and I want you to see how Jesus is trying to point this out to us in different places throughout the scripture, probably everywhere in the scripture, but I'm just getting a few of them that uh, resonated with me. So thinking in this term, so now listen to what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 7 and verse 24, being led by the Spirit. He's, he's, this is what he's writing, okay? O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who's going to deliver me from this stinking environment, this putrid environment, this sick, twisted, death-throwing Yep. environment yep. 8 1 through 11 therefore there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit in other words who found the right the right environment amen for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The, the, the environment that, that we have when we're in Christ separates or, or frees us from the influence of that other environment. Amen. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Keep in mind the environment thing is what we're just we're substituting on another word here. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded or to be environmentally disturbed about how you think or the way you react to things is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Or to get into the right environment, it's life. It's eternal life. And it's peace. Because the carnal mind 
is enmity against God. That environment and this environment do not coexist. They cannot coexist. That's why Adam had to leave. Yeah. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So the world out there, they, they go by their own environment. They're not subject to the environment of God. But think about it this way. The positive of that, the reverse positive of that, is that we are not subject to that environment either if right. we know who we are and we operate from this relationship with God. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so that be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man not, have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Praise the Lord. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Now what did God do when he raised Jesus from the dead? He took him out of this environment and put him back in the environment that he was originally in when he came to the earth. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's good for me. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal body by His Spirit that dwelleth in you and put you back into the right atmosphere. Amen. Where you can have everything that God has promised us. Glory to God. Amen. And we do that by filling our environment with praise, with joy. Amen. Amen. Uh, acknowledging the Lord. That's what Jesus did all the time. Until it fills the place that we've made. And the environment changes. That's all. That's all you've got to do. We think it sounds selfish of God to say, praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. It almost sounds hypocritical. In fact, I do it all the time because I've read some few things. And, I, and sometimes it's just out of ignorance. But I think it sounds good. I think I'll give it a shot here. I've got nothing to lose. But when I'm praying and, and doing my confessions for my family and, and kids and offspring and so on and so forth and health and finances and everything else, I always end by saying, and I bless you, Father, and praise you in Jesus. Now, how do I get the, the heck is that? I'm going to bless God in that environment. I have every right to. In fact, God expects me to. I'm equal with Jesus. I'm He's not ashamed to call me his brother. Right. We have the same father. We were created in the same environment. Yes. Praise the Lord. There's no sweating. There's no more hard work. No more contriving to be this or to be that or to get God to come and pat me on the shoulder and say, good job. You make an environment. An Eden. A delight. Delight yourself in the Lord. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. Yes. Ha, praise the Lord. The prescription for changing your environment to a garden of delight is just simply the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. These can be the days of heaven on earth. Praise the Lord. We can create an Eden anywhere we go, everywhere we go, anywhere we are. We just acknowledge his presence. Yes. Praise God. I'm telling you, I believe in the last days, before the new heaven and the new earth, we'll get so close that just like with the disciples, a shadow yes. can heal. Yes. Somebody who knows they're in the atmosphere of God, that they're in the presence of the Lord. That atmosphere, anybody that steps into it. It's like the woman with the issue of blood. What was she trying to do? If I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just get into the environment yes. where healing is natural, where healing yes. is normal, I'll be healed. Yes. Amen? Even though I'm still here, even though I'm still got the rags and I'm still sick and I'm still, you know, bleeding and I'm still broke and everything, if I can just get into his presence... If I can get into that environment, that environment is where healing is always taking place. There's just no sickness there. If I can get there, my financial issues will be taken care of. Because there's no lack there. If I can get there, the relationships that I've worked to try to fix and all I've done is screw them up and, and get to the place where you don't even want the relationship because it's too much work, It'll be restored. Right? 
because he was rejected so that our relationships can be restored. Praise the Lord. We don't need the EPA. We don't need no stinking EPA. We just need Jesus. And the whole atmosphere will change. Can you say praise the Lord? Let's give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Amen, amen. Just praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you are a loving God, a glorious God, the perfect Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for healing all of my diseases. Thank you, Lord, for prospering me. Thank you, Lord, for giving me long life and life that impacts and affects others in a positive way. Thank you, Lord, for the environment of love and grace and mercy and goodness. Thank you, Lord, that I dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Amen. You're blessed and dismissed in Jesus' name. Go ahead, Ron. Now can we see why the devil created religion? So he hid us out of God's environment. That's it. That's it. One where we rule and reign. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's where you get smog. That's where you get issues, praise the Lord. In other words, you know what happens when you get small? You don't breathe well. You don't yeah. see well. Uh, huh? Yeah. But where he is, all things are new evermore. Yes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Righteous joy, peace in the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. God bless all of you. In Jesus' name, be conscious of your environment. Praise the Lord. Yeah.